King Shalom can be read in 2 Kings 15, 17 to 22. Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king of Israel, reigning in Samaria. However, his rule was notably brief, lasting only a month. His reign was cut short when Menahem, son of Gadi, conspired against him and assassinated him, subsequently taking the throne for himself. Despite the short duration of his reign, Shalom's actions left an indelible mark, and he was succeeded by Menahem, who led Israel further into sin and sought alliances with foreign powers to solidify his rule. In the 17th chapter of 2 Kings, verses 1 to 6, we are introduced to King Hoshea, the son of Elah, who begins his reign over Israel in Samaria. He becomes king in the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, and his reign lasts for nine years. While Hoshea does commit evil in the sight of the Lord, his wickedness is somewhat less than that of his predecessors, the previous kings of Israel. However, during his rule, Israel finds itself under the threat of the powerful Assyrian Empire. King Shalmaneser V of Assyria sets his sights on Israel, and Hoshea initially submits becoming a vassal. As a sign of his subjugation, he pays tribute to the Assyrian king. But Hoshea's loyalty is fleeting. He later attempts to break free from Assyrian dominance by seeking an alliance with King So, the king of Egypt. This act of defiance doesn't go unnoticed. When Shalmaneser learns of Hoshea's betrayal and the secret dealings with Egypt, he reacts swiftly and severely. Hoshea is captured, imprisoned, and the consequences for Israel are dire. The Assyrian forces lay siege to the capital city of Samaria. This intense and grueling blockade lasts for three long years. Ultimately, Samaria's defenses crumble, and in the ninth year of King Hoshea's reign, the city falls to the Assyrians. The aftermath is tragic for the Israelites. They are forcibly removed from their homeland and resettled by the Assyrians in different parts of their empire, marking the beginning of the diaspora of the Israelite tribes. King Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat and the grandson of Nimshi, is prominently mentioned in the biblical books of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. He became the 10th king of the northern kingdom of Israel around the 9th century BCE. Jehu's rise to power was divinely orchestrated as he was anointed by a young prophet under the directive of Elisha. This anointment carried a specific mandate to destroy the house of Ahab for their idolatry and the blood they had shed. Jehu began his mission with great fervor. He intercepted King Joram of Israel in Jezreel, where he shot and killed him with an arrow. Jehu's zeal didn't stop there. He pursued King Ahaziah of Judah, who was present during Joram's assassination. One of the most dramatic events of Jehu's reign was the death of Jezebel, Ahab's widow. As Jehu entered Jezreel, Jezebel, adorned with makeup, looked down from a window. At Jehu's command, some eunuchs threw her down and her body was consumed by dogs, fulfilling a prophecy made by Elijah. Jehu then gathered all the worshippers of Baal under the pretense of holding a great sacrifice for Baal. Once they were assembled in the temple of Baal, he ordered his guards to slaughter them all, ensuring the extermination of Baal worship in Israel. However, despite these rigorous reforms, Jehu did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, who had set up golden calves in Bethel and Dan. While God had promised Jehu that his descendants would rule Israel for four generations due to his efforts against the house of Ahab, the kingdom suffered. Hazael, king of Syria, seized considerable territories from Israel during Jehu's reign. King Jehu reigned in Samaria for 28 years. His reign was marked by a mix of zealous religious reforms and continued idolatry, highlighting the complexities of Israel's religious and political landscape during that period. Menahem reigned as king of Israel for 10 years in Samaria. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, not departing from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which caused Israel to sin. During his reign, he attacked Tifsah and its surrounding territories because they did not open their gates to him. He mercilessly ripped open all the pregnant women in the city. King Pul of Assyria came against the land, 
and Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold on the kingdom. Menahem exacted the money from the wealthy Israelites, forcing them to provide 50 shekels of silver for the king of Assyria. Afterward, King Pul withdrew and did not stay in the land. The rest of Menahem's deeds and all he did are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. He was succeeded by his son Pekahiah. King Omri reigned over the northern kingdom of Israel during the 9th century BCE, and his leadership left an indelible mark on the nation's history. Emerging as a strong leader amidst political turmoil, Omri first served as a military commander before seizing the throne after the assassination of King Zimri. He then faced challenges from Tibni, another contender for the crown, but eventually solidified his rule after a prolonged civil conflict. One of Omri's most enduring contributions was his establishment of the city of Samaria as the new capital of Israel, the move from the previous capital, Tirzah, to Samaria was both strategic and symbolic. Located on a hill, Samaria offered a natural defense against potential invaders, and its central position made it a nexus of commerce and governance. Under Omri's guidance, the city was fortified and developed into a thriving center of culture and power. Diplomatically, Omri sought to strengthen Israel's position in the region. He formed alliances with neighboring kingdoms, most notably through the marriage of his son Ahab to Jezebel, a princess from the coastal Phoenician city of Sidon. This alliance with the Phoenicians not only bolstered Israel's geopolitical standing, but also introduced new cultural and religious influences, which would later become points of contention during Ahab's reign and beyond. Archaeologically, Omri's impact can be traced through the Moabite stone or Mesha Stele, an ancient inscription by King Mesha of Moab. This stele mentions Omri as the king of Israel, indicating the influence and recognition of his reign, even among neighboring nations. In summary, King Omri's leadership was characterized by political savvy, territorial expansion, and diplomatic engagements. While his reign was relatively short, lasting about 12 years, his legacy lived on through the Omri dynasty and the profound changes he introduced to Israelite society and politics. Zimri, mentioned in the first book of Kings, 1 Kings 16, 8 to 20, served as a commander in the Israelite army under King Elah. In a bold and treacherous move, Zimri assassinated King Elah while he was in Tirzah, getting intoxicated at the house of his steward Arza. After eliminating Elah, Zimri swiftly eradicated all the male descendants of the house of Bisha, thereby extinguishing the bloodline and ensuring no immediate threats to his newly usurped throne. His reign, however, was short and tumultuous. Almost immediately after seizing power, Zimri faced a significant challenge from the Israelite army, which was encamped against the Philistine city of Gibbethon at the time. When the army learned of Elah's assassination and Zimri's treachery, they proclaimed their commander Omri as the new king of Israel. Omri and the Israelite forces swiftly marched to Tirzah to lay siege to the city. Recognizing the dire situation and the overwhelming odds against him, Zimri made a desperate decision. He retreated to the citadel of the king's palace and set it on fire, choosing to perish in the flames rather than face capture or execution. Zimri's rebellion and subsequent death further deepened the political instability and division in the northern kingdom of Israel. King Joram, also known as Jehoram, was the son of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel. He ascended to the throne in the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat of Judah and reigned for 12 years. The account of his reign can be found in 2 Kings 3, 1, 1, and 9, 25. Joram's reign was marked by various military campaigns, including a significant one against the Moabites. In 2 Kings 3, the Moabite rebellion against Israel is detailed. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. In response, Joram allied himself with Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, to wage war against Moab. The allied forces faced a severe water shortage, but the prophet Elisha, who was with the army, prophesied that the valley would be filled with water and that they would defeat the Moabites. The prophecy came true, and they achieved a significant victory. However, 
Joram did not fully turn away from the idolatrous practices of his father Ahab. Although he removed the sacred stone of Baal which his father had made, he continued to commit the sins of Jeroboam, who led Israel into idolatry. His reign came to a violent end at the hands of Jehu, who was anointed by the Lord to destroy the house of Ahab. Jehu led a coup against Joram and killed him in Jezreel. Jehu's actions were in fulfillment of the prophecy that the house of Ahab would be punished for their wickedness and idolatry. This account gives us insight into the political and religious complexities of the time and underscores the consequences of turning away from the ways of the Lord. Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam II, ascended to the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel after the death of his father. His reign around 753 BCE is documented in the book of 2 Kings in the Hebrew Bible, although he was the fourth generation descendant of Jehu, fulfilling the prophecy given to Jehu by the prophet Elisha that his descendants would occupy the throne of Israel for four generations. Zechariah's reign was notably brief and tumultuous, lasting only six months. During his short reign, Zechariah continued the sinful practices of Jeroboam I, the founder of the northern kingdom, which included idol worship and deviation from the religious practices ordained in the Mosaic law. This period in Israel's history was marked by a departure from the worship of Yah, their creator, and a continuation of the practices that had led to moral and spiritual decline within the kingdom. The brevity and end of Zechariah's reign were significant in the larger context of Israelite history. His assassination by Shalom, as detailed in 2 Kings 15 verse 10, not only ended the dynasty of Jehu but also marked a turning point in the northern kingdom's stability. After Zechariah's murder, Israel experienced rapid changes in leadership and increasing political instability. This turbulence foreshadowed the eventual downfall of the northern kingdom which would be conquered and its people exiled by the Assyrian Empire in the years that followed. Zechariah's reign, though short, is a critical part of the narrative of the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah, illustrating the consequences of the leader's departure from religious adherence and the ensuing political chaos. Welcome to Chronicles of the Lost. Jeroboam II was a king of Israel who reigned for 41 years as described in the Old Testament books of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. According to the biblical account, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, who had led Israel into idolatry. Despite the prosperity and territorial expansion that Israel experienced under his rule, Jeroboam II failed to lead the people in the ways of God. Instead, he perpetuated the worship of golden calves and other forms of idolatry, leading Israel further away from the commandments of the Lord. The reign of Jeroboam II is often noted for its material prosperity, but spiritually it was a time of decay and disobedience to God's laws. While he was successful in terms of military campaigns and economic stability, these successes did not translate into spiritual fidelity. He did nothing to correct the religious and moral decline of the Israelites, making him a wicked ruler in the biblical sense. Ab was the son of Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel after the division of the united monarchy. He ascended to the throne in the second year of King Asa of Judah and reigned for two years from approximately 910 909 BC. Like his father, Jeroboam, Nadab did evil in the eyes of the Lord by perpetuating the idolatrous golden calf worship established by his father in Bethel and Dan. This was a significant deviation from the worship of the true God in Jerusalem and was a means to keep the Israelites from returning to the southern kingdom of Judah. While the Israelites were laying siege to the Philistine city of Gibbethon, a conspiracy arose against Nadab, led by Basha. Basha, who hailed from the tribe of Issachar, assassinated Nadab and subsequently exterminated the entire house of Jeroboam, fulfilling the prophecy that had been spoken against Jeroboam due to his idolatrous practices. With Nadab's death and the extermination of Jeroboam's lineage, 
Basha established a new dynasty as he became the next king of the northern kingdom of Israel. This period was marked by political instability and religious apostasy, with various kings rising and falling in rapid succession, further distancing the northern kingdom from the teachings and commandments of the Lord. King Pekahiah of Israel, who reigned in Samaria for a brief two years, was the successor and son of King Menahem. Despite the spiritual legacy and teachings handed down, Pekahiah chose to follow the idolatrous path set by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, leading the Israelites away from true worship. This deviation from the ways of the Lord was emblematic of many Israelite kings of that era. Pekahiah's reign, however, was cut short not by natural causes, but by a conspiracy led by Pekah, son of Remaliah, one of his own officers. In a calculated move, Pekah, with the support of 50 men from Gilead, stormed the royal palace in Samaria, assassinating Pekahiah, along with his close aides, Argob and Arieh. Following this coup, Pekah ascended the throne, marking another chapter in the tumultuous and often treacherous political history of ancient Israel. King Pekah, the son of Remaliah, became king of Israel and reigned in Samaria for 20 years. He did not follow the righteous path of the Lord, but instead continued in the sinful ways initiated by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. This deviation led Israel further away from the Lord's commandments. During Pekah's rule, Tiglath-Pileser III, the mighty king of Assyria, mounted an invasion against Israel. He successfully captured several territories, including Ijon, Abel Beth Marka, Janoa, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee, along with the land of Naphtali. The inhabitants of these regions were taken captive to Assyria. Pekah's reign was eventually brought to an abrupt end when he was assassinated by Hoshea, the son of Elah. After this treacherous act, Hoshea ascended to the throne as the next king of Israel. The chronicles of Pekah's reign, including his deeds and eventual fate, are recorded in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. 2 Kings 13 verse 10 to 25 delves into the reign of Jehoash or Joash who took the throne of Israel in Samaria after the death of his father Jehoahaz. His rule extended for 16 years and regrettably he did not deviate from the idolatrous ways of Jeroboam the son of Nebat which had ensnared Israel in spiritual downfall for generations. However, amidst his shortcomings, Jehoash displayed a deep respect for the prophet Elisha, as Elisha lay on his deathbed. Elisha then instructed Jehoash to take a bow and arrows. With Elisha's hands over the king's hands, Jehoash was told to open the east window and shoot. This act symbolized the Lord's deliverance of Israel from the oppressive Arameans. Elisha further instructed Jehoash to strike the ground with the arrows. Jehoash struck the ground three times and then stopped, much to Elisha's dismay. Elisha proclaimed that had Jehoash struck the ground five or six times, he would have completely destroyed Aram. Instead, he would now only defeat them three times. The prophecy came to pass. Israel, under Jehoash's leadership, reclaimed cities previously lost to the Arameans during the reign of his father, Jehoahaz. These victories were in line with the Lord's compassion for Israel and his promise to preserve a lamp for them despite their continued disobedience. The chapter also marks the end of Elisha's earthly journey. After serving Israel for approximately 50 years, the prophet passed away and was buried. A noteworthy event followed his death. A dead man, thrown into Elisha's tomb, was miraculously revived upon touching Elisha's bones, emphasizing the enduring power of God working through Elisha even after his death. The record of Jehoash's reign, his achievements, and his military might were chronicled in the annals of the kings of Israel. After his death, Jehoash was succeeded by his son, Jeroboam II, who continued the lineage. King Ahab, the seventh monarch of the northern kingdom of Israel, reigned during the 9th century BC. He was the son of Omri, who founded the influential Omri dynasty. Ahab's reign is particularly noted for his marriage to Jezebel, a Sidonian princess. This union brought about significant religious changes in Israel. Jezebel introduced and vigorously promoted the worship of the Canaanite deity Baal, and Ahab supported her in this endeavor. This widespread idolatry 
led to major confrontations with the prophets of the God of Israel. One of the most notable confrontations was with the prophet Elijah. To challenge the prophets of Baal and demonstrate the power of the God of Israel, Elijah proposed a contest on Mount Carmel. In this contest, the Baal prophets failed to invoke their God to set a sacrifice on fire, whereas Elijah successfully called upon the God of Israel to consume his offering with fire from heaven. This event was a significant demonstration of God's supremacy over Baal. Despite these religious controversies, Ahab's reign also had its share of political and military challenges. He waged wars against the Aramean king Ben-Hadad, and at times he managed to repel the Aramean invasions. Moreover, Ahab formed an alliance with Jehoshaphat, the Judean king, which was cemented with the marriage of their children. However, Ahab's character is often overshadowed by an incident involving a vineyard owned by Naboth. Ahab desired this vineyard, but Naboth refused to sell or trade it due to its ancestral significance. Jezebel, in her characteristic cunning manner, orchestrated false charges against Naboth, leading to his execution. Subsequently, Ahab took possession of the vineyard. This act of treachery was condemned by Elijah, who prophesied the downfall of Ahab's dynasty as divine retribution. Ahab's life came to a tragic end in the battle of Ramoth Gilead against the Syrians. Despite being warned by the prophet Micaiah of impending doom, Ahab went into battle and was fatally wounded. His death marked the beginning of the end for the Amride dynasty. The accounts of Ahab's life, his reign, and his interactions with various prophets are detailed in the books of one and two kings in the Bible. King Basha of Israel was notorious for his wicked actions, both in seizing power and in his rule. He committed regicide by killing King Nadab, son of Jeroboam, to take the throne. To further consolidate his rule, Basha exterminated the entire lineage of Jeroboam, a grievous act that also fulfilled a prophecy. Once in power, Basha led the Israelites deeper into idolatry, steering them away from the worship of Yahweh. His reign was characterized by sin as he followed in the ways of Jeroboam and caused Israel to provoke God to anger. Basha's malice also extended to the kingdom of Judah, where he waged war against King Asa and constructed a fortress at Ramah to restrict movement in and out of Judah. His actions were in direct disobedience to God's laws, marking him as evil in the eyes of the Lord. A divine prophecy pronounced by Jehu foretold the extermination of his lineage, much like that of Jeroboam. This prophecy was eventually fulfilled when his son Elah was assassinated, leading to the eradication of his family line by Zimri. Welcome to Chronicles of the Lost. King Ahaziah, also known as Azariah, was the son of the infamous King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, ascending to the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel after his father's death. His reign, although short, was significant in Israel's biblical history. Born into a lineage that had deviated from the worship of Yahweh, Ahaziah was heavily influenced by his mother's idolatrous practices, especially her devotion to Baal. This pagan worship further distanced Israel from their covenant with God. A pivotal event during his reign was when he suffered a fall from the lattice of his upper room in Samaria. Grievously injured instead of seeking guidance from Yahweh, Ahaziah sent messengers to Ekron to inquire of Baal-zebub, the Philistine god, about his chances of recovery. This act was a clear testament to the depth of Israel's apostasy under his rule. The prophet Elijah, a stalwart defender of the faith in Yahweh, was divinely informed of Ahaziah's inquiry. In response, Elijah intercepted the king's messengers and delivered a prophecy. Ahaziah would never leave his bed again and would certainly die. Shocked, the messengers quickly returned to the king, recounting their encounter with Elijah. Recognizing the description of the prophet, Ahaziah sent multiple groups of soldiers to apprehend him. However, with divine protection, Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume the first two groups. The third group, seeing the fate of their predecessors, pleaded for mercy, and Elijah accompanied them to deliver his message personally to the king. True to Elijah's prophecy, King Ahaziah did not recover from his injuries. With no direct heirs, his brother Jehoram succeeded him on the throne, continuing the legacy of Ahab and Jezebel, 
albeit with its own complexities. Jeroboam, the first was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel following its split from Judah, is often described as a wicked king in the biblical narrative. His reign is primarily detailed in the books of 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Jeroboam introduced the worship of golden calves in Bethel and Dan, leading the people away from the worship of the Most High, the God of Israel. This idolatry is cited as a significant sin that had lasting consequences for the northern kingdom. Jeroboam's rationale for these actions was largely political. He wanted to solidify his rule and prevent the people from going to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah to offer sacrifices. By doing so, he hoped to keep them loyal to his own kingdom. However, this led to the widespread abandonment of God's law and is considered by the biblical authors to be a direct violation of God's commandments. Additionally, Jeroboam disregarded prophetic warnings and resisted any efforts to bring the people back to the worship of Yahweh. His actions had a long-term impact, setting a pattern of idolatry and disobedience that many of his successors would follow. The Bible often refers to the sin of Jeroboam when recounting the deeds of later kings, emphasizing the gravity and lasting influence of his actions. Thus, Jeroboam is largely seen as a wicked king who led Israel into sin and whose actions had enduring negative consequences for the northern kingdom. King Elah, son of Basha, ascended to the throne of Israel after his father's death and ruled from the capital city of Tirzah. His reign, however, was short-lived, lasting only about two years around 886 to 885 BC. Elah's rule is primarily recorded in the first book of Kings in the Bible. Though the scriptures do not provide extensive details about his reign, it is clear that he continued in the idolatrous practices of his predecessors, leading the Israelites away from the worship of the true God. A significant event during his rule was his assassination, orchestrated by Zimri, one of his military commanders. The Bible recounts that while Elah was in Tirzah, he was getting drunk in the house of Arza, the steward of his house, seizing the opportunity Zimri went in and struck him down, killing him, and subsequently proclaiming himself king. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, is generally portrayed in a favorable light in the Bible, particularly in the books of 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. He was the son of King Asa and took steps to strengthen religious observance and worship of God in his kingdom. Jehoshaphat initiated religious reforms and sent teachers to educate the people in the law of God. However, Jehoshaphat also made some questionable decisions. Notably, he formed an alliance with King Ahab of Israel, who was described as wicked in the biblical narrative. This alliance led Jehoshaphat to join Ahab in the battle of Ramoth-Gilead, a decision later criticized by the prophet Jehu. In summary, Jehoshaphat is primarily seen as a righteous king committed to the worship of God but his record is not without blemish due to some of the alliances he formed. King Abijah, also known as King Abiah or King Abijam, was the son of King Rehoboam and the father of King Asa. He ruled over Judah for a brief period of three years, but before his death. Abijah, unfortunately, earned a reputation as a wicked king, following in the sinful footsteps of his father. The scripture notes, he committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his forefather had been. 1 Kings 15, 3. During his reign, King Abijah sought to reclaim the northern ten tribes of Israel into his kingdom, leading to continuous warfare between Abijah and Jeroboam throughout Abijah's lifetime. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon and the grandson of David, was a king of Judah whose reign is often characterized as wicked due to his poor decisions and lack of spiritual leadership. When he ascended the throne, the people of Israel asked him to lighten the burdensome labor and taxation imposed by his father Solomon. Instead of heeding the advice of the older counselors, who advised him to be kind to the people, Rehoboam listened to his younger advisors and chose to increase the burden, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, 
I will make it even heavier. Bar Kings 12, 14. This decision led to the division of the kingdom, with 10 of the 12 tribes breaking away to form the northern kingdom of Israel under Jeroboam, while Rehoboam ruled only over Judah and Benjamin. Rehoboam fortified cities for defense against Israel, but he also allowed idolatry and other forms of spiritual corruption to flourish in the kingdom, ignoring the covenant that the Israelites had with God. It is recorded that he did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. 2 Chronicles 12, 14. Rehoboam's reign is generally considered a period of decline, both spiritually and politically, for the people of Judah. King Jehoiakim of Judah, also referred to as Koniah or Jeconiah, ruled during a critical juncture in Judean history, a time when the Babylonian Empire was asserting its dominance over the region. He was the son of King Jehoiakim and ascended to the throne when he was only 8 or 18 years old, depending on the biblical source. His reign, however, was short-lived, lasting only three months and ten days during the late 7th and early 6th centuries BCE. Under the shadow of the Babylonian threat, Jehoiakim's leadership faced significant challenges. King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, unsatisfied with Jehoiakim's allegiance, laid siege to Jerusalem. This siege culminated in Jehoiachin's surrender. Making the situation even more dire, Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin, his family, his officials, and a large portion of Judea's populace as captives to Babylon. This marked one of the initial phases of the Babylonian exile, a pivotal event that had a profound impact on Israelite identity and theology. While in Babylon, Jehoiachin experienced a change in his fortunes. Initially imprisoned, he was later released by the Babylonian king, Evil Marduk. The scriptures record that Jehoiakim was treated with kindness and was given a position of honor in the Babylonian court, where he dined at the king's table and lived out the remainder of his days. Historically, Jehoiakim holds significance for his place in the biblical genealogy. King Jehoiakim, originally named Eliakim, was the son of King Josiah and ascended to the throne of Judah after his brother Jehoahaz's short reign. He ruled from approximately 609 to 598 BC. Jehoiakim was known for his allegiance to Egypt, especially since it was Pharaoh, Necho II, who changed his name from Eliakim to Jehoiakim and made him king. His reign was marked by a departure from religious traditions and oppression, and he is often criticized in biblical accounts for his wickedness and for leading Judah further away from God. The prophet Jeremiah particularly spoke against him, and Jehoiakim infamously burned a scroll containing Jeremiah's prophecies. Towards the end of his reign, Babylonian forces under Nebuchadnezzar Thaksu besieged Jerusalem. The exact circumstances of Jehoiakim's death are not clearly detailed in the Bible, but it is inferred that he died during this Babylonian invasion. His body was dishonored, not given a proper burial, and was possibly thrown outside the walls of Jerusalem. After his death, his son Jehoiakim succeeded him, but his reign was short-lived before the Judeans were exiled to Babylon. King Joram, also known as Jehoram, was the son of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel. He ascended to the throne in the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat of Judah and reigned for 12 years. The account of his reign can be found in 2 Kings 3, 1, 9, 25. Joram's reign was marked by various military campaigns including a significant one against the Moabites. In 2 Kings 3, the Moabite rebellion against Israel is detailed. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. In response, Joram allied himself with Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah and the king of Edom, to wage war against Moab. The allied forces faced a severe water shortage, but the prophet Elisha, who was with the army, prophesied that the valley would be filled with water and that they would defeat the Moabites. The prophecy came true, and they achieved a significant victory. However, Joram did not fully turn away from the idolatrous practices of his father Ahab, although he removed the sacred stone of Baal which his father had made. He continued to commit the sins of Jeroboam who led Israel into idolatry. His reign came to a violent end at the hands of Jehu, who was anointed by the Lord to destroy the house of Ahab. 
Jehu led a coup against Joram and killed him in Jezreel. Jehu's actions were in fulfillment of the prophecy that the house of Ahab would be punished for their wickedness and idolatry. This account gives us insight into the political and religious complexities of the time and underscores the consequences of turning away from the ways of the Lord. King Josiah, who became the monarch of the kingdom of Judah around 640 BCE, is renowned as one of the most righteous Judean kings. He assumed the throne at the tender age of eight, following the assassination of his father, King Ammon. Under his leadership, Judah underwent significant religious transformation. Josiah embarked on a comprehensive campaign to eradicate pagan worship, removing altars, idols, and high places dedicated to foreign deities, thus restoring monotheistic worship of the God of Israel. His zeal for reform was further intensified when Hilkiah the high priest discovered a forgotten book of the law, believed to be a version of the book of Deuteronomy in the temple of Jerusalem. Recognizing its significance, Josiah gathered the people of Judah and Jerusalem and publicly read the rediscovered text, leading to a renewed covenant between God and the Israelites. This act solidified the centrality of the temple in Jerusalem for worship. Politically, Josiah sought to reestablish Judean control over territories previously lost. However, his ambitions led him into conflict with the Egyptian pharaoh Necho Tsegdu. Despite being advised against it, Josiah confronted the Egyptian forces at the Battle of Megiddo, where he tragically met his end. Despite his untimely death, King Josiah's reign is remembered as a period of religious revival and dedication to the God of the Israelites. King Manasseh was the son of King Hezekiah, one of Judah's most faithful kings. When Manasseh ascended to the throne at a young age, he sharply diverged from his father's righteous path. He not only rebuilt the high places that his father had destroyed, but also erected altars to the Canaanite god Baal and made Asherah poles. One of the most grievous acts during his reign was setting up an idolatrous image in the very temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Furthermore, Manasseh engaged in various forbidden practices, including witchcraft, divination, and sorcery, and even consulted mediums and spiritists. The Bible recounts that he led the people of Judah and Jerusalem astray, causing them to do more evil than the nations God had destroyed before the Israelites. In addition to his idolatrous acts, Manasseh is criticized for his extreme cruelty and is said to have shed so much innocent blood that it filled Jerusalem from end to end. However, the narrative takes a turn when the Assyrians captured him and brought him to Babylon in chains. In his distress, Manasseh humbled himself and sincerely repented before the Lord. Moved by his sincere repentance, God orchestrated his release from captivity. When he returned to Jerusalem, Manasseh made efforts to amend his previous wrongs. He removed the foreign gods and the idol from the Lord's temple, tore down the altars he had built on the temple hill, and restored the altar of the Lord. He then commanded the people of Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. His story serves as a powerful lesson on the depths of God's mercy and the transformative power of genuine repentance. Welcome to Chronicles of the Law. Hezekiah was the 13th king of Judah, who reigned from around 715 to 686 BC. He is often remembered for his devout faith and zealous efforts in eradicating idolatry from his kingdom. Under his leadership, Judah experienced a significant religious reformation, which included the centralization of worship in Jerusalem and the destruction of the high places. Hezekiah also resisted the Assyrian invasion led by King Sennacherib, during which he fortified Jerusalem and built the Siloam Tunnel to ensure the city's water supply. The Bible attributes Hezekiah's success against the Assyrians to divine intervention. Furthermore, Hezekiah is noted for his plea to God to extend his life when he was mortally ill, to which God granted him an additional 15 years. His reign is detailed in the books of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and Isaiah, highlighting his commitment to the ways of the Lord and his efforts to lead his people in righteousness. Ahaz, son of Jotham, was the twelfth king of Judah and ruled during a time when the kingdom faced significant external pressures. The northern kingdom of Israel, in alliance with Aram, Syria, waged war against Judah, leading Ahaz to consider seeking assistance from the Assyrian Empire. 
The prophet Isaiah advised against this, presenting a divine message of trust and reliance on God. However, Ahaz opted to form an alliance with Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria. This alliance came at a cost. Ahaz had to pay tribute, which depleted the temple and royal treasury. His religious practices were controversial. Ahaz introduced foreign idols and altars into Judah, even going so far as to offer sacrifices in the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. One of his most notorious acts was setting up an altar modeled after one he saw in Damascus, placing it in the temple of Jerusalem and moving the bronze altar to another location. This deeply affected the religious purity of the Judean worship and was a significant departure from the practices of his forefathers. Ahaz's reign, lasting 16 years, was marked by these political and religious compromises. His decisions not only weakened the spiritual foundation of Judah, but also set the stage for future challenges the kingdom would face from the Assyrian Empire. Uzziah, also recognized as Azariah, ruled over Judah for an impressive 52 years in the 8th century BCE. Taking the throne at the tender age of 16, Uzziah embarked on significant infrastructural developments, fortifying Jerusalem's defenses with towers and walls, and emphasizing agricultural advancements. His reign saw Judah flourish economically and militarily. Guided in his early years by the prophet Zechariah, Uzziah was deeply rooted in his faith. However, with growing power came increasing pride. This arrogance led him to overstep his bounds by burning incense in the temple, a sacred act reserved only for priests. When confronted by the high priest Azariah and other temple officials, Uzziah's defiance resulted in a sudden onset of leprosy, marking his face and leading to his isolation until his passing. His life story remains a poignant reminder of the perils of hubris and the significance of adhering to divine ordinances. King Jehoash, also known as Joash, was the king of Judah and ascended to the throne as a young boy. His story is detailed in the Hebrew Bible, primarily in 2 Kings 11 to 12 and 2 Chronicles 22 to 24. Joash's reign began when he was just seven years old, after the wicked queen Athaliah, who sought to exterminate the royal line of David, was overthrown in a coup led by the priest Jehoiada. With Jehoiada's guidance, Joash initiated various reforms, including the repair and restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, which had fallen into disrepair during the reigns of previous monarchs. The funds for these renovations were raised by a system where the priests collected money from the people. However, after the death of Jehoiada, Joash's devotion waned, and he was influenced by the princes of Judah to abandon the worship of the Lord and turn to idolatry. This led to the downfall of his reign. Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, strongly rebuked the king and the people for their apostasy. But instead of heeding the warning, Joash ordered Zechariah's execution. The end of Joash's reign was marked by a successful invasion by the Aramean king Hazael, and Joash himself was eventually assassinated by his own servants. This account of King Jehoash serves as a poignant reminder of the importance of righteous leadership and the consequences of forsaking one's foundational beliefs. King Ammon of Judah, son of Manasseh and Meshulameth, became the 15th king of Judah reigning for a brief two years from approximately 643-3-641 BC. Taking the throne at the young age of 22, Ammon's rule was characterized by a deep-seated idolatry, echoing the transgressions of his father Manasseh's early years. Depict Ammon as one who walked in all the ways that his father had walked and served the idols that his father had served. Unlike his father, who repented in his later years and initiated reforms to bring the Judean people back to God, Ammon remained steadfast in his wickedness. This defiance against the ways of the Lord culminated in a conspiracy against him. Ammon's own servants orchestrated his assassination within the confines of his palace. Yet in a twist of fate, the people of the land swiftly avenged Ammon's death, killing those who conspired against him. They then placed his young son, Josiah, on the throne Josiah's reign would be marked by a profound spiritual reawakening, turning the nation back to the teachings and covenant of the Lord. Athaliah, 
hailing from the house of Omri, was the daughter of Israel's king Ahab and queen Jezebel. Through her marriage to Jehoram, king of Judah, she bridged the two kingdoms. However, her path to power was marked by treachery. After the demise of her husband and son Ahaziah, she ascended the throne of Judah, marking her as the kingdom's only female monarch. Her reign was characterized by the promotion of Baal worship, mirroring her parents' idolatrous practices. In a bid to consolidate power, she ruthlessly ordered the extermination of the Davidic royal lineage. Yet, her grandson Joash escaped this fate, hidden away by his aunt Jehosheba. Six years into Athaliah's rule, a revolt led by the priest, Jehoiada, resulted in her capture and execution at Jerusalem's horse gate. Historically, Athaliah's reign is viewed with disapproval, her story serving as a potent reminder of the dangers of unchecked ambition and forsaking divine guidance. Jotham was the son of King Uzziah, also known as Azariah, and became the 11th king of Judah. When his father Uzziah was struck with leprosy as a punishment for trying to burn incense in the temple, Jotham took over the responsibilities of the kingdom, although he wasn't officially king until his father's death. He began his reign around the 8th century BC and ruled for 16 years. Notably, Jotham's leadership was marked by righteousness. The Bible specifically mentions that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, much like his father Uzziah, but without committing his father's error of entering the temple. This showed Jotham's respect for the sanctity of the temple and the distinct roles of kings and priests. Under his leadership, Jotham undertook significant building projects. He fortified the Ophel in Jerusalem, built towns in the Judean hills, and constructed forts and towers in the forests. These efforts strengthened the defenses of Judah and showcased Jotham's commitment to ensuring the security and prosperity of his kingdom. However, while Jotham himself was faithful to the Lord, he faced challenges in leading the people of Judah. The Bible records that the people continued to act corruptly, indicating that while the king was dedicated to God, he struggled to lead the entire nation in godly ways. Upon Jotham's death, his son Ahaz, who was notably less faithful than his father, succeeded him. Jotham's reign stands as a testament to a leader who tried to uphold righteousness amidst a society that often drifted away from God's commands. Luke 21 verses 12 to 22 And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. On the day before his crucifixion, our Lord went into the temple for the last time and denounced its inhabitants as being the sons of those who murdered the prophets, a brood of vipers and those destined for the condemnation of hell. Jesus called the destruction of Jerusalem the days of vengeance. By crucifying the Son of God and by their continual rejection of the gospel message and its messengers, they would prove whose sons they were. Rejecting the covenant made with their father, a large percentage of the Israelites chose to follow Satan. Satan was truly their father and like father, like son. The measuring cup was filled, 1 Thessalonica 2, 14 to 16. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. The destruction of Jerusalem was an act of God's vengeance and judgment, not Rome's. These would be the days when Israelites were punished for their sins. This refers not to Roman vengeance, but to God's. Luke wanted his readers to understand that Jerusalem's desolation was not simply a tragedy or a wretched twist of fate. It is the result of God's wrath. The Roman army under Vespasian and Titus, like the Babylonian army under Nebuchadnezzar,
the destruction of Jerusalem, Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled.